¿Qué buen club de fans que tienes? Pedro. Uno que. Ya me dirás. Los tengo. Los tengo. Me ha costado. Me ha costado. Mira, aquí no viene ningún seminario. Y hoy. Eh, se ha vencido de Club de Fans. También eh? pagado, también pagado. ¿Cuánto le has pagado, claro? Todo eso, todo eso es pagado. ¿Qué dice? ¿Puede ser la cortina que sí. no se vería la So that uh, today he, he will speak about some inter an interesting topic as is the Carmenes as precursor for new instrumentation in for the ELP. So. Thanks, Pepa. <coughs> well, thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, most of you will probably have already heard about Carmenes, or the word Carmenes. Actually, being in Granada, this is not difficult. But um, today I want to um, explain a little bit about uh, the instrumental project Carmenes uh, that, was, that has been developed in the past few years right here at the AEA and has been integrated at the, um, at the other side of the, of the street. Um, but first I would like to give a brief summary of the um, uh, scientific niche of the instrument, why the instrument was designed as it is, and, and what cases it will uh, cover. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit on, on this niche. Uh, I will give a brief, uh, very brief review on explanatory science, and then I will talk about Carmenes, uh, the current status of the of the instrument and the project in general, and how Carmen has led us to uh, contribute to high risk at the ELT. So the, the, the 
idea of building uh, an instrument like this, like Carmen's, um, well, uh, came from the general needs of, well, on one side, the uh, Spanish supplementary uh, community uh, that uh, wanted to contribute to the um, the, the the field that uh, the, the field that has grown a lot since in the past few years, uh, starting with the first discovery of uh, of uh, hot Jupiter, and to the current days to to, the, to today that uh, we know more than ten uh, um, uh, Earths and super Earths orbiting other other stars, and also on the other hand from the um, well the stellar community that uh, wanted to uh, get a better knowledge on the interiors of and the structure of, uh, of the stars and on the evolution of, of, uh, of the stars and the whole system star, star and planets. So um, from these, uh, uh, co um, this, the needs from these communities uh, came the, the need of building an instrument that could afford uh, uh, aborting these uh, science cases. And uh, the first one, the exoplanetary uh, science case, uh, I must say that currently there are some 33 potentially habitable planets already detected. Uh, this, this, actually, this figure is from January this year, and since then it has already been uh, one more Detected. These are all the the, um, the terrestrial planets uh, orbiting in the habitable zone of their stars. But uh, most of them, well, at least ten of these uh, planets um, are still without a confirmation, or they are their, their existence is in doubt because of um, because of um, some. Um, effects that can come from the star itself, from the physics of the star itself, and could mimic the presence of the planet. So these 10 are already uh, a little bit dubious, and the rest, uh, most of the, of the remaining uh, planets already detected, has been detected by Kepler, and Kepler is a, a photometric mission, and, and they cannot um, uh, do um, real Doppler confirmation from, for these objects, so the, the, the presence of these uh, planets is, so, is only validated uh, statistically not to be um, false positive. So they are not real detections, but validations of not, of not being uh, false positives. So in, in, the, in the end, we, we remain, there remain only a handful of, uh, of, of confirmed detections of this type of, ob of objects. And, uh, but in any case, as this uh, picture was getting a little bit crowded with so many planets already detected, uh, PHL has, uh, has been infographing uh, this other set, which uh, shows uh, what it is called the top potentially habitable planets ranked from closest uh, to the, our solar system to Faber. Um, these are defined as uh, in the top uh, um, uh, in the top rank of potentially habitable planets because they cover uh, the a definition, a conservative definition of what, of what it is an exo an, exo an exoplanet in the habitable uh, zone or a habitable exoplanet. And this conservative conservative definition is. Um, is based on uh, mass or radius of the star, uh, and the conservative definition uh, gives a, a smaller range in mass and radius for a, a planet to be called a terrestrial planet. This is between 0. Point, I think it was 0. 0.5 and 5 Earth masses for the mass of the planet, and between 0. 0.8 and 1.5 Earth, Earth radii for the radius of the planet. And uh, it's also um, um, has to be in the conservative definition of the habitable uh, habitable zone. The habitable zone. Um, well, I uh, suppose I don't have to uh, extend me uh, extend it too much. But uh, the habitable zone uh, is that region around the star uh, at, at the distance uh, 
uh, when you can have uh, the temperature, the right temperature on the surface of the planet as to, be, as to have uh, um, liquid water on the surface of the planet. So, um, this, by the way, is Captain B, uh, is the closest uh, potentially uh, habitable terrestrial planet uh, to Earth, and uh, this, this uh, uh, planet was discovered by, by us uh, in 2014 in, a, in, a, in the context of a wider collaboration. But this uh, may change soon, as um, you may know that we are also monitoring Proxima Centauri in search for what really would be the closest habitable exoplanet to Earth. Um, well, if I'm, I'm not going to enter much in this, uh, because then I, will, I won't have time for the rest of the talk, but if you want to know more about how our quest is going, uh, you can go to our uh, webpage, paleredot.org. Um, and um, I have to say also that we may even have something to say about uh, another planet. This is uh, the planet called Krypton. Um, yes, uh, you have heard right. Uh, Krypton is uh, Superman's uh, uh, home planet. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything else. If you want to know more about this, you can uh, watch this video and you will understand what I'm talk talking about. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, in both cases, uh, Carmen's can contribute to, this, uh, to these quests. Because the main science objectives of, of Carmen's in general are the detection <coughs> of terrestrial planets in the habitable zone around aim type dwarfs and the study of the formation of planets around these stars. The main uh, scientific niche of the instrument, uh, as it as, uh, as was uh, when the instrument was uh, designed, is practically still unexplored. The exoplanets that Carmen has uh, find uh, will not only add up to the 2,000 plus already detected planets, mainly orbiting uh, one <coughs> solar mass stars, this is the, the mass of the star versus the mass of the planet in Earth masses. But thanks, but thanks to the um, uh, technical capabilities of, of the instrument, um, um, they will fill actually this uh, space here for the <coughs> lowest mass uh, stars. Uh, with, uh, we hope uh, around 100 uh, new Earth and super Earths. Well, this uh, um, will allow us basically to uh, infer or to have at least a very robust statistics of, uh, of planets uh, for this type of stars. And then we will be able to uh, constrain the models of uh, planet formation and evolution around, around these, uh, these stars. Um, Carmes will um, detect a significant number of rocky planets in the habitable zone of their stars, um, what will allow uh, us to refine also the parameter called Eta Earth. Eta Earth is a parameter that gives you the fraction of uh, rocky planets in the habitable zone per stars in this type of uh, stars, in M stars. Um, why... The question you may be uh, asking yourself is why we observe M stars for uh, looking for uh, habitable planets and not uh, sun-like stars. Well, basically, um, M stars represent a shortcut to detect uh, Earth-like planets. Um, you have to you know that uh, Earth around the Sun produces a Doppler shift in the Sun that is uh, only of about 10 centimeters per second. This is uh, not uh, reachable uh, by any instrument currently working. Um, but uh, one of such planets orbiting an M star uh, can produce a much larger uh, Doppler shift and therefore can be detected by current instrumentation. Um, so um, this is one of the reasons M stars are smaller 
Another reason is that the habitable zone for these uh, cold stars is closer uh, to, the, um, to, the, to the star. Therefore, again, this adds up to, to the detectability of the planet. And basically also because uh, M star are so numerous that uh, well, they represent uh, about 75% of the, of, the, of the stars in our galaxy and, and, they, are, and they are available out there uh, <coughs> in plentiful. So, uh, let me ask you uh, if uh, in the habitable concept there is included the core rotation or not? I mean, it's not the core rotation in the sense that the planet face always the, is included in the definition of habitable or not? No, I don't think it is included in the habitable zone in this in the this definition of habitable. <coughs> yeah, but but um, there are studies that take into account uh, correlation of plants for habitability. Okay. But it's, I don't think it is included in this. Okay. Well, in any case, um, a part of, of all these uh, characteristics that these plants will, will have, uh, the most prized objects that uh, carmes may detect are those that, uh, on top of that, uh, transit their, their stars. So, um, um, well, Carmenes, we estimate, will uh, detect a handful or a few uh, of, of, of these planets, and uh, they will be the main targets for future space missions and, and telescopes. These uh, missions like, for instance, the James Webb Space Telescope or uh, the ELT, actually. Um, so uh, these, um, these, these future instruments will be able to characterize the atmospheres of these uh, terrestrial-like planets. Uh, therefore, in the, in the next years, Carmenes will um, make a very important contribution to the um, stellar and explanatory science cases by, by detecting all these uh, objects and, and will be complemented by, by some of these uh, by, by some of these other instruments, but also it will be essential for providing targets for many, or for many of them. So to achieve the scientific um, objectives, uh, Carmenes observes in a wavelength range, in a large wavelength range, uh, that peaks, uh, uh, that, that is centered uh, at the, at the or covers uh, the, where the, the flux of the M stars peak, at around between <coughs> 1,000 and 1,400 1, nanometers, and uh, it will do a continuous coverage of this wavelength range uh, from, in total, from 550 nanometers to 1,700 uh, nanometers. Um, this uh, this is actually a very um, a technically advancement in, in, in one of these instruments because up to now only instruments uh, observing in the, in the visible range have been able to provide this radio velocity precision needed for the detection of planets. But for these M stars, these uh, optical instruments lack uh, the flux needed to achieve the precision. So that's why for late M stars we need the near infrared. Uh, coverage. In general, these are the technical specifications of Carmenes. Um, well, Carmenes was designed as a single purpose high stability instrument with a requirement of achieving uh, 5 meters per second uh, precision in the visible and the near infrared with a goal of 1 meter per second for both uh, channels. Mm, the one of the main differences between the visible channel and the infrared channel is that the visible channel is working at ambient temperature while the near infrared channel is cooled down to 140 K. Um, calibration, uh, Carmes uses the, the, the technique, the calibration technique of observing simultaneously uh, the <coughs> object and the, and the calibration uh, at the calibration spectrum uh, in the same detectors. You, find, you can see both uh, a spectra, uh, and this calibration light is provided by either um, radium neon um, lamps, a Fabry Perot etalon, or even could be uh, in the near future a, a laser comb. 
resolution is uh, of 82,000. Um, we can compare this 82,000, for instance, with the eight, I think it's a maximum of 17,000 uh, provided by uh, by uh, Exshooter. <coughs> Exshooter is the is the other instrument uh, with a very broad wavelength coverage uh, at ISO at the VLT. Or we can also compare this resolution with the 100,000 resolution provided by Cryres, which, which is a, an ISO a near infrared instrument, uh, but we, which gives a very small uh, wavelength coverage compared as compared with uh, Carmen's. This is the diagram of the instrument. Well, basically, the front end attached to the Cassegrain focus of the telescope collects the light from the star and from the calibration units from, from the near from the near infrared channel and the visible channel, uh, and injects uh, this light into circular fibers that go down to the Coudé room uh, of the 3.5 meter telescope. And uh, at some point, these uh, fibers uh, change from circular to octagonal. And this is to increase the, um, the, the stability of the illumination, uh, which is necessary for high precision or high stability instruments like this. So, uh, Carmenes, as it said, will study uh, M dwarfs. Uh, the main sample of Carmenes is around 300 M dwarfs to detect and characterize uh, plants with radio velocities together with studies of uh, <coughs> uh, this is gone I think right now okay to the, together with the studies uh, uh, of asteroseismology and uh, magnetic activity to um, get information on the hosts uh, stars the consortium consists uh, consists on uh, of uh, 11 Spanish and German institutions uh, the observatory is one of the members uh, of the consortium and uh, we were awarded a guarantee time uh, with uh, 600, between 600 and 750 useful nights uh, guaranteed for the main survey of Carmenes, uh, which was funded by um, uh, different uh, German and Spanish agencies. Uh, the main ones were the Max Planck Society, the, the SIG, uh, and then the national, uh, national German and Spanish uh, uh, ministries. Also, we we got uh, funds from from the industrial reg uh, regional funds and European federal funds. Okay, um, the final instrument concept arises from the merging of three um, three concepts that were presented in this workshop in the instrument uh, instrumentation workshop for Caralto in 2008. Um, from the Spanish side, I presented a near infrared uh, a spectrograph, and the German side presented, or well, some of the instruments that, that were presented there were presented by, by German institutes, and they were presenting um, high resolution spectrographs, in general, in the visible or multi object high, uh, multi -object high resolution spectrographs. Um, well, just after the meeting finished, I started the contacts to merge uh, this near infrared uh, spectrograph with their um, concepts, which uh, has brought us to the current uh, uh, final concept for cameras. Uh, the schedule was uh, was really tight. We we started with the preselection of Carmenes together with another instrument in January 2000. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the preselection of Carmenes as the instrument for, for the, for the 3.5 meter was, was done in January 2009. We have a kickoff meeting in, in February 2009. Uh, the conceptual design review was, uh, uh, was uh, held in, in, in Granada here in October 2009. A post conceptual design review in July 2010, we got green light from um, from the um, uh, Carl Alto Executive Committee on November 2010 to build the instrument. We didn't know what was going to happen with Carl Alto and with the instrument up to that date. Uh, then we have the preliminary design review uh, in July 2011 and optics and final design review during 2012 and 2013, starting manufacturing uh, immediately after FDR uh, and finishing in October 2015. That means 2.5 years of 
uh, manufacturing assembly integration and verification phase. Commissioning uh, started in, uh, in October and ended in December and the main survey uh, with guarantee uh, time started 1st of January this year. So during the past 2.5 years our schedule was completely mind-blowing, uh, was, uh, it was crazy, but in particular in 2015 we have uh, we finished the MIV phase for the two channels and I will show you some pictures. Uh, both channels have a similar design, they are not quite the same, they are, there are many differences, but the, 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 the main concept is the same. And uh, well, you can see here pictures of the visible channel uh, being integrated at the, at the laboratories of the Landeschen Warte in Heidelberg. And we can see the optical bench, uh, the, 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 grating, the, the, the grating mosaic, uh, the collimator uh, coated in, 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 in silver, the camera over there. So, um, the same for the near channel that was being integrated here, as I said. We have the collimator there co uh, coated in gold, uh, um, collimator support, uh, optical range in inside the radiation shield already, radiation shield closed, radiation, uh, all, all the, the radiation shield plus the optical bench inside the vacuum tank over there. Uh, part of the um, uh, cooling system, the preparation unit here, down here, uh, made in collaboration, built in collaboration with ESO, and uh, part of the team that are working at the laboratory. Uh, these are some of the main subsystems of Carmenes uh, and, and, and the companies that built the subsystem. We have, uh, we have worked with companies uh, in Spain and abroad. We have the detector mosaic built by Teledyne, the radiation shield built by Cryovac here in Spain, uh, the, um, the blanket, the isolating blankets, the multilayer isolating blankets uh, by Yeyer Aerospace, the preparation unit in collaboration with ESO, Windlight built the camera, and Newport built the, the grating mosaic. <coughs> So um, the delivery of the instrument uh, was made in three phases. Uh, the main uh, big system of the instrument was delivered in, in, uh, on the 23rd of April uh, last year. This is the front end uh, that, was, uh, that arrived uh, on, uh, to Caja on that date. And it was uh, successfully reintegrated and commissioned uh, in, 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 the, in the following two weeks. So this this is um, sorry this is uh, an image of uh, of Caja staff and, and the consortium staff uh, uh, making uh, or installing the front end of the telescope. Uh, and then this is a uh, 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 well an image of the of the front end itself. So the visible channel um, arrived uh, to the observatory on the 15th of August. Uh, it came by truck from Heidelberg and um, it came in two parts. Um, it came first, the vacuum tank came to the observatory and then the spectra itself without the optics and the, and the, and the mounts came to the, to, the, to the observatory. And the first time that we integrated vacuum tank with uh, a spectrograph was at Palo Alto, something that shouldn't be done. Uh, this was a risk we took, uh, but uh, the schedule was, uh, was requesting these uh, risks to be taken, um, and, and this was done like this, because of this risk. Um, the this channel, as I said, arrived in a truck, and this is the downloading, uh, the, the tank flying uh, uh, through the open space of the 3.5 meter telescope dome. Probably you know this uh, uh, image from the press release uh, or, or one similar to this one. And then uh, eventually uh, the tank um, resting on its final uh, place, on its final location at one of the climatic rooms in the, in the Gude room of the 3.5 meter telescope. The delivery of the near infrared channel was uh, took took place on the 19th of September. Again, uh, we in this case we loaded. It was done by truck too from here from the IEA. We loaded the 
the tongue with the di with a, with a difference with respect to the visible channel that the, the spectra and part of the optics and mounts were already inside the inside the tank. And this was uh, also another risky decision that we took uh, because of uh, many reasons. Uh, one of them was the schedule, but uh, everything went well. The truck arrived uh, safely in a very bad in a day with a very bad weather. It was raining a lot, uh, but eventually it got there. And it, it, again, it was, uh, um, it was transported, it was uh, uh, downloaded and, and, and put by crane uh, to, into the, the, the pit of the telescope. Commissioning um, went uh, from the 15th of September to the 18th of December 2015. Um, it, we also uh, took a few more days in, in December, the 22nd and the 28th, 28th and 29th of December. And um, these are images from this uh, commissioning. Uh, part of the team was uh, there. We, we, we had to uh, make shifts for doing the commissioning, a very intense commissioning of uh, one month and a half. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, everything went well for such a very short commissioning time that we had. Um, and we took for the first time, uh, at that time, uh, spectra, simultaneous spectra with the near infrared channel and the visible channel. Um, and this is one of the images taken by the near infrared channel. So, Carmenes is now currently in operation since the 1st of January uh, this year, and well, the survey has started uh, on, the, on this very first day of the year. Um, the current status of the, of the instrument and the project is that, uh, well, basically, um, we, we signed a provisional acceptance uh, on the very last day of last year, and we are, we are now in this uh, provisional acceptance phase until we sign the final acceptance. Uh, Carmenes is running the official uh, GTO uh, survey since the 1st of January. Carmenes is offered in open time. Uh, this is the second semester that has been offered. Uh, has been already offered in the first semester of the year. And uh, well, um, I have to say that um, uh, there has been a significant increase in pressure in the in the in the telescope or the telescope of the 3.5 <laughs> telescope is now uh, something like around 3.2. Uh, about 70% of the night's uh, requests of the 3.5 meter telescope is for, for Carmenes. Uh, this was a schedule driven project, as I said, uh, because the delivery date was fixed by the uh, agreement between the MPG and SESIC on the operation of, uh, of the observatory. It was extremely <coughs> tight and without any or very little contingency. Um, just uh, for comparison, uh, a, phase a, ISO, a, phase e, a phase A instrument, sorry, um, a phase A um, period for an instrument at ISO uh, takes something like, uh, well, for HIRES, for instance, it's now two years. Uh, for Carmen, it took seven months. Um, I think for commissioning, the usual period, the usual um, amount of time uh, available is around one year. Uh, for Carmenes, it, it was, uh, as I said, well, in total, I mean, all, the, all the time was two, two months. So um, you have to also to take into account that Carmenes is like two ESO instruments by, by themselves. The near infrared channel and the visible channel are, are similar in concept, but are different instruments. They have had, a, they have given us their own problems, and, and they have been commissioned uh, first separately and then uh, together. So uh, these were two ESO instruments commissioned in, commissioned in two in two weeks. So I think we did, I think honestly, uh, we did very very well in this uh, in this uh, project. Uh, so in, in this sense, the budget, uh, the final budget for the for the instrument was around six point eight million euros, and um, well. There are still some risks, and this is that we don't have any budget left for the operation phase. Um, and well, we are still testing the the only requirement that we couldn't test during commissioning. All the requirements were fulfilled, but the only one, the long-term stability, 
uh, is the only one that couldn't be performed because we haven't had long term, long time to to um, to check this this uh, requirement. So Carmen is today what? operating both channels in their location and providing loads of beautiful data and available to the international community, by the way. I, I, I would like to say here, uh, just a, as an afterthought, that um, there are many <coughs> big issues, small details, and even lack that may, may make possible, possible this, ki this kind of projects, uh, that, that we reach the end of this kind of projects. But one of them, uh, I think is the main one, is, uh, is the, the people involved in them. And I have to say that uh, people uh, in general in the consortium, but in particular here at the IEA, uh, the, the team of engineers have been uh, working very professionally and, and, uh, and uh, they have been very committed to this project. And this is one of the key uh, points for, for having been a success uh, in arriving to the telescope in time. Uh, and coming to science, or uh, starting with science a little bit. As part of the commissioning, I tried to take some, some images, uh, with this, uh, some data with spectra, with a spectrograph of uh, extended um, objects uh, to try and test the, um, um, how the, 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 the instrument was performing when observing uh, objects that are not uh, point source objects, like the one we are observing. And I tried to observe uh, in the Orion bar, and I got uh, this, okay? I said, okay, I'm gonna try with another extended object. Uh, I'm going to point to the ring nebula. Uh, I tried to observe that, and I got this. Uh, well, <coughs> let's try with the third one. I, I pointed to a solar system object. I pointed to Mars, and even uh, to other planets, and I got this. Wow. wow. Impressive. Well, it is impressive actually, um, because this is the normal format of a uh, uh, an initial spectrograph. Uh, you have here the the, the, the orders, uh, the dispersed orders uh, of the incoming light, and well, images are nice and provide information. But this type of uh, of uh, spectra at this resolution provide loads loads of information, and uh, everything is working as it should. And, uh, well, as I said, maybe a little bit boring, but uh, with lots of uh, very, very interesting data to, to extract from there, and information to extract from there. Um, the shell spectrograph, uh, in, the, in particular in the near infrared channel, uh, as for any other shell spectrograph, uh, wavelength uh, runs uh, in each of these horizontal orders from left to right and in the spatial direction from bottom to top. Um, and this is uh, a blown up of this spectra where you can see the two fibers, one for the object, for one for the science, and one for the calibration simultaneously, taken at the, sa at the same time. Uh, and each of them sliced in two, uh, in two parts. And this for technical reasons to, to be able to reach the, the resolution that, is, that was requested for Carmelis. So this is the, the two images of the whole Carmen's instrument in the near infrared and in the visible spectra, uh, spectrograph. And this is the data uh, extracted actually from those images you, you have previously seen um, for one of our stars, Luton <coughs> star. And this uh, spectra at 82,000 resolution runs from 550 nanometers to 1,700 nanometers. Well, there, uh, there is uh, many hours of work, many days of work to extract uh, the information that we can, that we can extract from there. Well, um, I mean, mm, uh, there is uh, lots of things here, uh, from, from tellurics, from the Earth atmosphere, to the, to the star, and, and uh, now we have thousands of, of, of spectra like this. So lots of work. So Carmen is, is being provided to the international <coughs> community since the uh, 1st of January, as I said, and will become an instrument, uh, a CAHA instrument, uh, on, the, on the signature of final acceptance. But um, again, uh, regarding science, uh, Carmen can contribute to all those science cases uh, which need 
precision in radial velocities for whatever reason. Maybe your amplitude is very in radial velocities is very small, and Cummins can provide high precision radial velocities. You can uh, have the need of, of getting high resolution large coverage in the near infrared. This is the only instrument now uh, providing this type of of, uh, of uh, data at 82,000 resolution. You can have the need of increasing the information that is provided in the visible wavelength range by combining it simultaneously with the, with the near infrared or comparing the results from the visible with the near infrared. So all these are unique capabilities of Carmen's. Um, Okay, uh, the, as I said, the near infrared channel is cooled down to 140Ks, and, and for providing this cooling, um, the, the near infrared channel uh, needs uh, some way of, uh, of, of, of getting this, this, this cooling. It, 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 is, it has a cooling system that was uh, designed, uh, developed, uh, developed, and built in collaboration with, uh, between the IAA and, and ESO. Um, and this is a, actually a prototype that is now currently working at the, at the observatory uh, that provides um, stabilized nitrogen, a flux of stabilized nitrogen gas at 140 Ks to cool down the instrument. Um, and this concept is based on the uh, continuous flow cooling technique that ESO applies to cool down their uh, detectors. Uh, um, uh, in any of the instruments already uh, working uh, at ESO. So this um, is um, a technique that is working, but it is the first time that it's being used to cool down a whole instrument, not, not only the cryostat, a small cryostat of a, of, a, of a detector in the instrument. This concept still uh, needs much more research and development. Um, well, Carmen has left us very, very little time to investigate the whole potential, potential of, the, of, the, of the system. Um, and uh, actually we are now looking for funds um, to, to build a new prototype of this uh, system. Um, uh, in any case, we have proven that this concept is, is very flexible. Um, more flexible, of course, than any of the, of the techniques uh, being used up to now, and it, and it can provide ultra stable um, uh, flux of uh, coolant. And they have, for because of this, we have uh, proposed it uh, to another instrumental projects. And one of these is uh, high rest, high rest at ELT. Um, we we are we have. Um, acquire a know-how of working with Carmen's and now we are proposing and we are using uh, this know-how to uh, work uh, and contribute to another instrument like this one. So HIRES is one of the instruments in the ELT instrumentation roadmap. You can see it uh, over there. Um, the HIRES consortium uh, to which Spain belongs um, has just signed the, um, uh, the phase A kickoff. Uh, this was signed on the 22nd of March. So we are currently on, on phase A, uh, on the, on the beginning, at the beginning of, of phase A, which is, will uh, last for two years. High res actually, in concept, is similar to Carmen's in the sense that it, co it will cover a very broad wavelength range from the blue to the uh, near infrared K band in modules, what we call channels in Carmenes. Um, and this will be, uh, this will be, will be built uh, in principle to work simultaneously as in Carmenes. And we hope to be contributing at least to the, uh, to the um, cooling system of the near infrared uh, channel of, uh, or module of uh, Hyrus. <coughs> this consortium uh, <coughs> is uh, formed by 12 countries, uh, contributing with 29 institutes. We thought that Carmen's was big with two, with two uh, countries, so this is really big. Uh, this is probably collecting all the interest of the whole ESO community in this type of, of instrumentation and this type of, of, of data. 
uh, of uh, high resolution spectroscopy. Uh, there are three Spanish uh, institutes uh, belonging to the consortium, the high risk consortium. These are IEC, the IEA, and the Center for Astrobiology. They are the um, the IEA is already contributing to the to the phase A studies. We have uh, we have we are contributing actually in the well. I will explain a little bit this this uh, this diagram. We have uh, well ISO as the as the main uh, contractor uh, for the for the instrument. Then we have the PI is Alessandro Marconi from Enough, uh, and at the head of the of the consortium you have the PI and the board of COIS, um, uh, with one representative for from for 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 country. Uh, so we have then uh, the project scientist, project manager, and the science advi advisory team, and the project office, and then all the work packages that will be developed in phase A. Uh, IEA is already contributing the project office uh, with uh, well, with one of our engineers, with Santiago Becerril, who is the the, the, de deputy, the deputy system engineer and the cryovacuum architect. Architect, sorry. Uh, I myself am uh, um, the deputy instrument scientist. And uh, well, we have uh, we will be developing and contributing to part of this of this work. Okay, I suppose you cannot see anything here, but basically uh, this tells you that the phase A will last uh, two years. Um, actually, I cannot even see it here. Uh, starting from this twenty second of March, as I said, we have one one point five years to produce all the documents needed. And, and then deliver it to ESO for review. At the end of the two years, uh, ESO will decide whether they give us a green light for building, for, for the manufacturing of the, of the instrument. And well, basically this is my last slide, and as uh, conclusions, uh, I would like to say that, well, Carmenes at the IEA, um, has uh, brought us a long way in a very short time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think that this is for the IEA and also in general for uh, for, for for the community in Spain. But uh, I think that more fun uh, and more excitement excitement will come in the near future. So this is the the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you. I have for one question. Uh, which is uh, the magnitude limit you can reach with, uh, in the continuum uh, with the Carmenes at uh, the 3.5 meter telescope? Well, we, we have the estimates we have for our uh, survey uh, is that um, we will observe uh, stars with J magnitude uh, around uh, 10.5 and uh, providing a resolution a signal to noise ratio of uh, something like 100. In principle, J equal nine means means signal to noise ratio of of uh, 150. These are the numbers for our science. So we need a high signal to noise ratio for the precision we need. Uh, but from from there, you can work out uh, numbers. Easily. And in K, do you have? No, in K I can say because uh, Carmenes doesn't include K, the K band, uh, so we are we always work in the J band, but uh, from there you can uh, easily work uh, what the limits for for your object of interest is. Okay, thank you. Ah, Rafa, have you any time series of the radio velocity for any object? To show up? Uh, no, not yet. We we have time series. We have time <coughs> series that ha are being collected, but uh, well, we started only three three months ago. We are covering a range of stars, so we are taking for each star a, an observation, and and we have time series, but they are short, of course. Um, 
what I can say is that uh, the radar velocities that we are getting are within requirement. But of course, uh, in this very short time, the, uh, we have had the time to, to improve even our own um, pipeline, even, even the way you extract and, and uh, compute your radio velocities can affect the precision that you get. And we are still learning with an instrument that has been operating for a few months and, well, and has been commissioned uh, in, in, in only two months. So everything is working uh, within requirements and we are increasing the precision every day. We are touching things to increase the precision that CAM is, is uh, providing. And, and I, I remind you that the, the precision, the requirement was 5 meters per second. The visible channel is working much better than that, and the near infrared channel is uh, is not uh, getting this precision, but is uh, is on its way, I, I should say. But it's still work work to do to to extract the the, the, the best from the from the instrument. Well. Um, for instance, as an example, well, uh, I don't know if this is answering your question or if this is related to what you were trying to understand. Yes, my question was related with the, uh, if you, uh, any instrumental effect, you... Yes, well, we, ha we have instrumental effects, yes, yes. Uh, this is something that we still are understanding on how to, on how to perform, perform better and to get to high positions. Um, you, you always have instrumental effects that uh, you can you can understand and and, uh, and 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 in this way improve your radio velocity positions. So an example, uh, Harps North, the Harps instruments are the most known and the, the the reference for this type of work. Harps North have been working now for three four years. After three four years, actually uh, our group us uh, is still detecting things, uh, instrumental things that are not working uh, at, the, at, the, at the instrument. Uh, the, we, we found some problems with the atmospheric dispersion, the, uh, dispersion uh, corrector. Um, this introduces systematic effects and, and even after four years you can have people working on the instrument actually uh, and, and trying to get the most of it will, will go deeper and deeper in the data and find new things. Uh, but doing this is good because then you can correct them and you can increase your precision. Yeah, the first thing is you have to Yeah, yeah. Pipe, uh, a, a pipeline uh, was required um, with the rest of the instrument. Uh, it will, it is offered to the well, not yet, not yet, but because we are working on it. But uh, uh, it will be offered to the to the general community, um, and uh, it is being it is being um, improved every day, every day. Yes. With the data, with more data we take, the more it is improved. It's an effort that is mainly done here in the house also? Or it's a um, pipeline is the responsibility of, uh, of Gottingen in Germany, but we are providing information to increase and to improve uh, uh, the precision that they get from, from, uh, from their data, of radio velocities uh, computed from the data. But it not, not, we are not uh, involved directly in the development of the pipeline of garments. Okay, Enrique. Uh, and also about the pipeline, it's, also, it's only uh, in the wavelength and uh, dimension, or we also include uh, the flux calibration? No, we won't include the flux calibration. This is, Especially with uh, shell spectra, this is a delicate step, and, and this uh, should be done by the by the observer, by the scientist uh, observing with garments. It's only 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 pipeline to extract the the spectra, wavelength calibrated, and uh, produce uh, radio velocities even. Anyone? 
question? I Well, Jano is uh, covering the K-band, but it's uh, at lower resolution. Actually, uh, I think this morning I, I saw a paper, I think it was this morning when I saw a paper uh, from Jano performance on radio velocities. And I think the, the best uh, radio velocity they are achieving now in very bright objects is 10 meters per second. It goes down to, or it goes up to 50 to 80 meters per second uh, for a little bit uh, fainter objects. Jano uh, um, can do part of the job, um, um, but uh, it's, I think it's not designed specifically for, for very high precision studies. Uh, and in com well, when it is connected to, to hubs, they will be providing uh, also a, a broad coverage. But this is this is nothing new. I mean, I mean, after Carmenes, there will be many others, actually. Uh, we were the first on the sky, and there will be this one. It will be, uh, they will attach an infrared channel to the Harp South spectrograph, too. Uh, and, and, and this will be, we hope, a standard uh, uh, type of instrument in, in, in the near future, because if they will be needed, many more of them, uh, for, for the science that is to come. Question or comments? No? Let, then let's thank uh, Pedro for this very interesting, very interesting talk and also I think we we take the advantage to acknowledge all the things because I think it's a very wonderful instrument. Thank, thank you. you.